Hey y'all, I'm Dr. Marta Perez, OBGYN, and welcome to my channel where you're look Welcome to my channel where you'll learn everything about pregnancy, birth, and more. I'm so glad you're here today. Today's episode is on inductions of labor. Okay, I've been wanting to do this episode on inductions of labor for a really long time because I see so much angst and controversy about inductions of labor on social media that I just do not understand. And honestly, I don't see the same controversy and angst in my clinical practice. There's so much I could cover about inductions of labor. I'm gonna pick out some of the things that I think are most important, but I'm gonna welcome all of your questions at the bottom because we can do follow-up episodes. What is an induction of labor? Okay, so if you've watched my what is labor episode, you know that labor is contractions causing cervical change. Someone can go into labor on their own when their body's cues tell them to. We don't actually have labor exactly figured out in human physiology, which is a whole nother thing. But when you go into labor, when the body goes into labor on its own, it can be a slow process, it can be a fast process. There's a lot of remodeling that takes place behind the scenes of the cervix and then there's the contractions causing cervical change. An induction of labor means that the person isn't feeling the strong regular contractions causing cervical change, but we're using some medications to help the body get to the point where it's in labor and stays in labor. So an induction of labor is us using modern medicine and science to help the body into the labor process. Why would someone have an induction of labor? There's two main reasons someone would have an induction of labor. One is medical necessity. So unfortunately, one of the realities of pregnancy is that although it can be one of the most amazing parts of someone's life, it can also be a scary and dangerous time. So a medical reason for an induction of labor could be because a person has a complication of pregnancy that puts their health in grave risk if the pregnancy continues. An example of this is the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. Another example of medical necessity for induction could have to do with fetal well-being. For example, some babies are not getting the nutrition and the things that they need through the placenta or umbilical cord and are showing us signs that they're not getting enough either low fluid or too small growth. And an induction is necessary because their risk of stillbirth is getting higher because of the condition. So we wanna get the baby to the outside where it can be nourished via eating instead of from the placenta. These are just two examples, there are even more, but I wanted you to know that some people, induction of labor is necessary for medical reasons. The next reason to have an induction of labor is elective or because it's someone's choice. And we're gonna talk more about that in a second, but someone can choose to have an induction of labor anytime after 39 weeks. Why 39 weeks? Well, if you've watched my what is a due date episode, you know that although full term is considered 37 weeks and above, between 37 weeks and 38 weeks, there are a little bit higher rates of some breathing problems when babies are first born, minor ones that go away, but at 39 risk, the risk of having those breathing problems and the risk of being pregnant too long for the baby and other problems from that about equal out. So 39 weeks is like the sweet spot for babies. So that's why you can choose to have an elective induction anytime 39 weeks and beyond. How is an induction of labor performed? So an induction of labor is performed with a few different medications that we have. The first thing to talk about is the cervix. So the cervix is an organ that is very dynamic. I like to use the example of an ear. So up at the top of our ear, the connective tissue there is rather hard. A cervix can be in a more firm state, even towards the end of pregnancy, even very far into the end of pregnancy. But we want the cervix to be soft, like the bottom of our ear, because as those contractions are happening, it's easier to get through a nice curtain than it would be to get through a door, something hard, right? So we want it to be soft. Some cervixes are naturally softening on their own in the last weeks of pregnancy, but some at the time of induction will need help softening or ripening. We use medications that are typically placed in the vagina called prostaglandin medications. They help soften the cervix. They can cause contractions, though they don't always. They really do like behind the scenes, invisible work to make the cervix a little softer. Again, sometimes can cause contractions, but usually not. So usually when those are used, you have either four hours or in a different type of prostaglandin, 12 hours of slow, what we call ripening or readying of the cervix. If the cervix is already soft at the time of induction, 
or you've already had the prostaglandins, it might be time for oxytocin or pitocin. And it's actually the same exact compound that your brain makes that we can put through the IV that makes the uterus contract so that those contractions put pressure on the cervix and cause cervical change and delivery. There's one other way of what we call cerv cervical ripening and that is mechanical dilation. And that's used with a small balloon catheter. It's about this big. We gently thread it through the cervix, inflate the balloon and put it on some gentle traction. And that helps the cervix kind of thin out and open just a little bit, it's about four centimeters, gently over time. This is uncomfortable to have done, but it's not super painful. Some people actually go to the doctor, get it put in, go home and come back to labor and delivery another time. Some people have it done in the hospital with no pain control. Some people have it done in the hospital and they do have pain control. So if that's something that your doctor thinks is a good idea, it can really speed up the time from the start of the induction to having the baby. Let's talk more about elective inductions of labor. If your induction is medically recommended, I definitely recommend you go through with that for important reasons to protect the pregnant person's health and the baby's health. But there's definitely room for elective induction of labor anytime 39 weeks and above. And let's talk about the background. So in the old days of data that was not high quality, they looked at people who were having an induction of labor and people who came in labor and delivery already in labor and saw that the people having the induction had a longer time in labor and possibly a higher C-section rate. But we always know that naturally occurring labor is going to be a, more efficient. We don't have to use medicines. We don't have to kind of coax the body into it. So that's the wrong comparison to make. We don't want to compare people having induction to the exact same people coming in in labor. What we want to compare is someone at the same stage they're induced at 39 weeks, or they're allowed to continue pregnancy and just see what happens. So there was a super large randomized control trial, which is a great kind of research study called the ARRIVE trial. And when this was published a few years ago, it drastically changed the field because we found out more about inductions of labor and their safety. In the ARRIVE trial, there were 3000 people in each group and it was your first pregnancy and you were overall low risk. And when you signed up to be in the trial, you signed up in your 38th week of pregnancy. They came to you and said, we don't know what's best, having the induction or seeing what happens in your pregnancy. So would you like to do this trial? And if you volunteered, which a lot of people did, 6,000 pregnant people, which is great, you were assigned one of two things randomly. You were either put in a pile where you had an induction of labor in 39 weeks or you didn't. And we just saw what happened. So for some of those people who didn't have an induction at 39 weeks, they may have gone into labor at 40 weeks, or they may not have gone into labor at all and required an induction in the 41st week, or they may have gotten hypertension disorder of pregnancy in the 40th week and had to have an induction anyway because of a fetal or maternal reason like hypertension. And then they compared those two groups, the see what happens group and the induction group. And what they found is that the C-section rate was lower in the patients who had an induction at 39 weeks. The rate of C-section among the induction group was 18% and the rate of C-section in the see what happens group was 22%. That was a decrease in the rate of C-sections by 36%, which is a big decrease when you're talking about 6,000 people total in the trial. The people in the induction group also had a lower rate of having a hypertensive disorder in pregnancy compared to the see what happens group and they reported less pain and feeling a greater sense of control over their birth experience. So they had a high level of satisfaction with that outcome. The differences between the outcomes for the babies were overall the same except that babies in the wait and see what happens had a higher rate of needing respiratory support after they were born versus the babies at 39 weeks had less of a chance of needing respiratory support or attention. Because these findings, especially about the C-section rate, were so powerful and obvious, there have been some arguments within the OB community that perhaps we should rename induction of labor at 39 weeks and not call it elective, but call it risk reducing because you're decreasing the risk of C-sections and hypertensive disorders of pregnancy if you have an induction at 39 weeks. Now, I don't know that I agree with changing the terminology to risk reducing. I recognize that for some people, the experience of going into labor is important to them and they will accept a little higher C-section rate and a little higher risk of a hypertensive disorder in pregnancy for the experience of going into labor. This may be especially true for those people who are trying not to use medications for pain control during their labor, and they may find that it'll t they'll spend less time in labor if they go into labor on their own. So 
I don't know that I agree with risk reducing terminology, but I do think it's really, really important that you're making the decision about having an induction at 39 weeks or seeing what happens in your pregnancy with the right information. The fact that inductions do not raise C-section rate, they actually decrease it. And that they're extremely safe for the baby, maybe safer than the seeing what happens. And you can decrease your risk of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy or needing an induction down the line perhaps. And you can make a choice in the middle. You can say, I see that arrived data. I want to go to labor in my own. My kind of uh, compromise is going to be that I'm going to give myself the 39 week to see if I go into labor and I'll have an induction at 40 weeks to try to reap some of those benefits, but also give myself time. So there's lots of options. There. I also want to note that this data came out and it is not surprising that when we're coaxing the body to get into labor with an induction versus someone who comes in in labor, you do spend more time on the labor and delivery floor for an induction versus uh, when you come into labor on your own. So not all labor and delivery units can accommodate inductions of labor for anyone who would like one at 39 weeks. So if you're interested in a 39 week induction, definitely talk to your doctor about it. Don't wait till your 38 week appointment either since some labor and delivery units require a reservation and the spots can fill up pretty far in advance. So talk to your doctor about it. Maybe at the beginning of the third trimester would be my recommendation because you want to make sure it's available and there's going to be space. And if that's a priority for you, that you are on the list to be able to have it or have it as soon as your labor and delivery unit can accommodate you. Let's talk about some pros and cons to induction of labor. So some cons to induction of labor is that, like I said, you'll be on the labor and delivery unit for a little bit longer. A lot of, I see a lot of talk on social media about inductions being more painful than labor, and I kind of want to frame it differently. So if someone goes into labor on their own, they've probably been having some contractions on and off leading up to actual labor, and their body may have gotten to a point kind of behind the scenes that's more advanced versus when we're coaxing your body into labor, we have to do all of that work with the contractions that your body may have been doing behind the scenes. So I would say for some people, they find that the length of time with an induction is a longer length of time of contractions. And if they want to avoid pain medication, there could be less success there, although there isn't data on that. And remember in the trial, the people with the induction actually reported less pain. I think it's because they could get an epidural as soon as their pain is escalating versus their pain accidentally es escalating while they're on the way to the hospital in labor and not being able to get pain control until they have arrived at the hospital and are checked in and have an IV, etc. The people in induction are already sitting there. They're like, oh, I'm not in pain in my induction. And then two hours go by, they're like, oh, I'm starting to be in pain. Time for my epidural or time for my pain control. So I would say that there's a reframe there. If you're just talking about contractions, they may go on for longer and induction goes on for longer. But if you're talking about being in control of your pain, that's actually was lower in the ARRIVE trial. The other thing is with the medications that we use for induction of labor, you can't do the intermittent monitoring, meaning you'll have to be on the fetal monitors full time instead of being on the fetal monitor and then coming off of it and then going back on it. So if intermittent monitoring is important to you, then I would avoid induction of labor. What are the pros of induction of labor? So obviously we discussed in the ARRIVE trial, there is a lower C-section rate, a lower rate of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, and babies are less likely to need the length of their respiratory support. But there's other things that are important too. Having a sense of control about pregnancy is important for a lot of people. Additionally, a lot of people, especially those with other family members and children to care for and arrange child care for, especially during this whole pandemic situation, having a date when they know they can expect to arrange child care and have things set up either for work for their family life, et cetera, can be very beneficial for them. I'm also someone who's taking care of a lot of people who are military families. And sometimes we definitely have to schedule around a partner's ability to be there for their child's birth. And so that gives a lot of power to military families as well. All right, I could deep dive so much further into many of these aspects of induction of labor. So if you comment below and you already hit subscribe, because I know you did, and you've already liked this video, right? You can tell me what episodes you'd like to see on more information about inductions, and we will get to that on my channel. All right, guys, thanks so much for joining me. I can't wait to see you next time. I hope you have a very lovely day and a lovely weekend. New videos every Friday. Bye.